Hello, everyone. We are here at St. John the Evangelist on this Solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity. Today is the first Sunday in ordinary time after the season of Easter has been completed uh, with the celebration of Pentecost last Sunday. And here we are um, this first Sunday back in ordinary time. And what do we do in this season? But uh, particularly having contemplated the redemption, our redemption in Christ Jesus, our uh, new life in him, we have been invited to contemplate the mystery of the most holy trinity. And so I hope you can check out our video um, and our masses. Father Barrent has the 1.30 mass. I had the 10.30 and the 8 a.m. this morning. And so um, please tune in uh, to those videos for the YouTube uh, channel that you can see at St. John the Evangelist. And, um, and there's just a host of videos from masses and wonderful activities that you can see there. So happy to be with you today. Jesus and coffee in our mug, a great mug that I got from one of our um, youth group families and, um, and, and, and one of our uh, students who serves as a, a beautiful lector. So it's so good to be able to uh, enjoy a little Jesus and coffee time. Great. So we'll take a look at some of our videos here and um, any questions that may come up. And we have the, uh, we already have one of our family and friends here watching. So, so good to be with you. Um, and I know that, again, a beautiful day today, how it's uh, it sort of cleared up. Um, every day was supposed to be raining, thunderstorms and the like, and it just kind of kept missing us. But today was a little bit cleared up, so it's been really good. Um, hi, Judy. Nice to see you. I see you're watching as well. So good to see some of our parish family and friends coming together. And, um, and looking forward to our continuing conversation, especially if we have, um, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on how perhaps the Holy Trinity has been explained to you in the past. Um, certainly we have the example of St. Patrick who uses the, um, the clover, the shamrock. And um, with it's one shamrock, but with the three petals, so they are distinct, but one. Um, so that's an example that has been shared. Certainly we, we talked about the beautiful image of uh, the lover, the beloved, and the love between. So the Holy Trinity is a challenging subject and a, and a challenging um, reality for us to understand, not because God or the church want to confuse us, but rather that there are realities ab about God and, and the supernatural that are sometimes beyond our natural understanding. And that's okay. That's okay if there are things that we don't fully understand in this life. Uh, we are, you know, uh, it's been said that the human person is the seeker of truth. That there is a desire to go out and to learn and to understand. Isn't that the very reason we look up at the stars and imagine ourselves flying up into space. Here in the United States, we just had that beautiful um, uh, um, unifying action, if you will, as a nation coming together and, and sending astronauts, us astronauts here from the United States, from American soil. Um, that can be a wonderful unifying event as we, as we, um, as Ronald Reagan once said, slip the surly bonds of, 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 of the earth, of gravity, right? And, um, and so when human, when human um, uh, enterprise endeavors to go beyond our own confines, our own limitations, that's a good thing. And we want to be able to go beyond. We want to be able to seek out. That makes us properly human. There's, rarely will we find creatures in the animal kingdom who take on adventure for the sake of adventure. They may seek uh, 
distant lands for food or for territory and shelter, but rarely for adventure. That makes us a little different than the rest of creation, doesn't it? We want to go out beyond. And there's something about that that, as St. Augustine once wrote, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. Yes, we, there's a desire to go out of ourselves, to break free from the limitations, because we know that we are finite beings. We know that we are limited. And so look how science tries to, to um, push the bounds of, of health and medicine, even questioning um, the necessity of death and our own mortality. And, and God be praised that science pushes uh, to, to make us better. But sometimes science can also push us and make us worse. Um, because if we try to, you know, there's this whole thing of cryogenics or this, uh, this question of beating death as though it's some sort of illness. Well, in a sense, we are pursuing a greater good which is eternal life, but we're probably doing it in the wrong direction. Why would we want to, why would we want to solve the mystery of the body if we haven't yet considered the mystery of the soul, which animates the body? Um, but that means that we must have a proper understanding of the human person as body and soul. So, let us um, be good practitioners of health of mind and body, health of soul, spirit, um, and, 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 and go beyond. Go beyond our limitations. Go beyond the limitation of your pride. Go beyond the limitation of your lust, limitation of your anger, limitation of our vices. If we allow ourselves to be um, humble, then we can allow ourselves to be raised up. Because God wills us to be raised up. Not by our own reaching for the fruit of the knowledge of, of the uh, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as Adam and Eve, our first parents, as that primordial man does reaching out of, of their own will to, to, to gain wisdom and knowledge, or reaching up to build the greatest constructions of our own human ingenuity as we build towers and fall into Babel. No, if we allow ourselves to go deep in our interior life, not in a place of selfishness, but as a place of our encounter with God, then we can really come to know ourselves greater than we are, greater than our limitations. Because we see God who creates, who, who made us of himself to be like himself. He's made us in freedom. And that is what separates us from all other creatures. That we, that we have a free will that's not dictated by instinct or dictated by circumstance. But we have a will that can allow us to love, to even love s such that we lay down our lives for one another. And look what's happening in, in, in the United States today with all of this. Um, with this, with this violence. There are many good protests, and we need to protest for what is good, for what is holy, the dignity of the human person. The dignity of the human person, no matter what color their skin, no matter what their racial background or economic background, whatever their, uh, whatever their heritage and, and circumstance may be, that there is a dignity to the human person. 
And we need to fight for that proper dignity. We need to fight for our freedom. But freedom doesn't mean licentiousness or license. License to do violence. License to steal. License to take what may be our due. What may be even our due, but to take it by force instead of exercising the freedom of our the freedom of our will, our voice, our very, um, our very uh, uh, being. And so I invite you, dear brothers and sisters, to be, to be saints. I said that at Mass, and, um, and I say it again here. Be saints. Rise to the dignity of your humanity. And it's a dignity that's been redeemed in Christ, that's been raised up from its own depravity or, or, um, or uh, slavery, not by the force of another. And that has been a scandal in the life of this nation, certainly. But now it's being replaced by another slavery, a slavery of want, a slavery of, um, of disrespect, a slavery of, of, of sin. And so let us fight uh, that we truly may be brothers and sisters in Christ, that we may be, um, uh, that we may be free as God makes us free, raises us up to be free, not according to the confines of our limitations, but according to his very plan and desire for each one of us. So, um, just an invitation and a prayer, a thought. Uh, happy to, uh, to, to share with you some thoughts on the Most Holy Trinity as, as a contemplation of our power for love, of our freedom, of our, of our redemption in Christ, who is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. When we contemplate the mystery, we can find ourselves there because we can find ourselves in Christ. If you see yourself as saved in Christ, as redeemed in Christ, in communion with Christ, then it means that you have a place through him in the very majesty of God himself. But if we see ourselves as other, and I can do it on my own, and I have my own, I can save myself, well, then how will we find ourselves in God? Maybe according to, the, according to the order of creation, but even there we will exhaust ourselves because we are not the makers of our being, but we are sharers in the very being of God who wills us to be united with him. So contemplate the most holy trinity humbly, faithfully. Contemplate the holy trinity as, as your authentic dignity redeemed in Christ. Um, so we have some family and friends visiting us, and I saw some of you after Mass, at Mass, of course, and I'm excited that you're tuning in now. So um, always eager to, uh, to have good conversation. My gosh, there's already eight of us watching right now. And that's awesome, and we'll probably get more views as it goes on. Um, and... Uh, and um, I'm just uh, grateful for your participation in your faith. And I, as a priest, um, as a pastor, have, uh, have, have the task of leading us to ever deeper faith. And I'm excited that you are sharing with me in that work uh, to go deep, to know that your life is precious and valuable and made for union with God. So... Why don't, uh, so let's start with some questions, and we already got one some from some of our friends of St. John the Evangelist Parish, so some of our uh, parishioners who help uh, promote our parish, especially on this Facebook page. We have a question, why don't dogs and other animals go to heaven? Oh my gosh. So let's, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, why don't dogs or other animals go to heaven? 
So let's say <laughs> um, God has created all things as beautiful and good. God who is the creator, God who um, uh, has, has, has made all, you know, all of creation in this beautiful world in which we live, um, who has set it into motion, brought it into being, God who is, remember our homily today, God is, he is the supreme being, and all things that are come share in his being. And, 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 but he has allowed for this, these creatures of his, this being that comes from him, uh, to take on different shapes and forms, different, different animals, different creatures of the world. And, and through this brokenness of sin, that is the brokenness of evil, we are, um, we are, uh, that there is a brokenness to the order of creation. And so there are creatures that are, there are creatures that are, um, uh, you know, that, that, that the lion and the lamb don't live in harmony. That, that, that there is, that there is, you know, that, that the order of the world has been, um, has been disjointed because of the evil that has entered in uh, to the world, to the human heart, and into the human context in which we live, which involves all of creation. Uh, so that's just a kind of an invitation that there's already in the world, there's all this variety, right? Um, and animals, you know, animals are creatures in this world. And God has created them, um, God has created them as part of the beauty of this creation, the beauty of the world, and even our dogs and our cats, <laughs> uh, for, for us to be able to exercise dominion not as some sort of abstract power in, in subjecting creation under our power, but rather, but rather for us to exercise responsibility, to exercise care. And we have the responsibility of care of creation. Um, and we can rejoice with, with our dogs and our cats. We can Enjoy uh, our horses and all, of the, and all of the animals that God has placed in this world. Um, but they have a different share in being than you and I do. They are animated by a spirit, yes. There is, as it were, an animal soul that, that, that makes this particular dog or this particular animal have, a, have a, almost a character different than another dog or different than another animal. But the one difference between the animals of the world and, and you and I as animals, as it were, is our rational nature. That you and I have reason. You and I have a will that is exercised purely for its own sake. And, and, and that is to glorify God to be united to the will of God, that, that can be united to the will of God. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, they, they, in their being, they give glory to God, in their being. So this morning I was sitting, uh, having a bit of coffee, and here at our parish we have beautiful cardinals around. And, and there was one nest began with just a pair, and then it's grown into so many more. And there's beautiful cardinals that, uh, that sing and call out to one another. And, and, and if we contemplate the, the life of the, a bird um, or the life of any creature, it is uh, made for the glory of God. Beautiful plumage, beautiful song. But uh, what does it spend its life doing? Seeking food, um, seeking a mate to perpetuate its, 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 its very... Um, nature. 
And, and, but that's what it does. Eat and sleep and seeking a mate. Eat, sleep, seeking a mate. That's what it, that's what it does. The birds of the air and, 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 the, and all the creatures of the world. Um, and, and they don't have to worry where they will find their food. The Lord provides. You hear it in sacred scripture. Um, you know, he, he does not, does not God even take care of the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. So these creatures, all the creatures, are for the glory of God. And you and I are made for the glory of God as well. But instead of our song or instead of our plumage, we give glory to God by our will. And a will that is, that is to be free, but in that freedom can choose good or choose evil. A dog, a cat, a bird will not choose good or evil. It will not seek to be evil for its, for its own desires, for its own sake. An animal, a lion, will chase down and a, a gazelle, not because it desires, merely to, it desires merely to kill, but to feed. I remember I lived up in Alaska once. During, um, uh, for two summers, I lived in Alaska in college. I worked at, at this hotel and and, um, and I was studying hospitality management. And, um, and so I had the opportunity to, to work in Alaska uh, for a few summers. And it was a particular busy season in Alaska. Obviously, it gets a little snowy and cold during winter and dark in winter. But in summer, it's full of uh, life and light. And, and the animals of the territories there as well are full of um, light and life. They're really coming out of hibernation like the bears, beautiful uh, grizzly bears of Alaska. And, 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 and coming out of hibernation, you know, there's the, um, there's the salmon run, the salmon running to spawn and to, and to continue to, to grow and to, and to continue their nature. And the bears are there. And there is this place called Brooks Lodge, Brooks Camp where if you've ever seen pictures uh, of multiple bears on this river, uh, um, river with the falls in it, and they're standing at different parts of the falls, whether in the deeper waters or up on the top of the little falls, not, too, not, I mean, not terribly high, but um, that's, that's Brooks Camp in Brooks Lodge. And, um, and, and that's a special place in this, in this uh, wilderness of Alaska. Where, where the salmon are jumping and the bears are all congregating because it's, it's easy for them to catch. And the bears, which, which, who are typically solitary animals, um, would come in big number there because they're all singular in purpose. They want to feed. They want to feast. They're not going to attack each other, which they usually would do in other parts when, uh, when, they, when they're not united in that one purpose. But they're at Brooks Falls. Uh, they're all focused on one thing, and that's storing up uh, their bellies and eating as much as they can. So, but the funny thing is, is that there's this camp you can go visit, and and um, and there are trails leading up to the camp. And you and I remember myself walking these trails. Um, leading to the platform near the near the river where where you were higher up and, and safe from all the rest of the bears, um, but but getting there you're just out in the open, and I remember seeing bears like 20 feet away, and they see me, <laughs> so you'd think oh my gosh I'm out in the wilderness of Alaska, and there's this big old bear, like 20 feet away from me. And so our our, our response would be oh my gosh I'm gonna get eaten alive. Well, no, the bear's not going to attack me. And it and, and rarely happens that bears, you know, we keep our distance. Um, we don't startle them. Uh, but, but they're not going to attack us because they're, they, they, they are fed on the, easier, on the easier food that is fish rather than this, you know, tall fellow named Father Michael Pierce. <laughs> um, so I remember seeing the bears. And they, you know, they're not hungry, so they're not chasing me. They're not there to attack me. I'm not, I'm not causing them any um, fear. I'm not causing them any distress. And so we're in the right relationship. Our needs are satisfied. Now when the bear gets hungry and a new need has presented itself, 
Well, then, and, and then, and let's say there's no food around. Well, then he may t turn towards me and say, there's dinner. <laughs> so, um, so the creatures of the world, you know, respond to, uh, the creatures of the world respond to their needs. And, and, and if there is no need present, then there's no, then there's no reason to fear. But, but, but again, because of, of the distorted nature of the world, um, you know, our needs are passing and, 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 and we'll never be fully satisfied. But a bear will be satisfied with a full stomach. Man will not be so easily satisfied with just the simple things of life. Man seeks something greater, seeks something bigger. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O oh God. Um, so let's get back to the question about animals and, and dogs in heaven. God has given us all of the all of creation uh, for us to rejoice in, for us to have care for, and we can care for our animals. But God has not created our animals for heaven; He's created us for heaven. We are made for heaven. We and what is heaven? A perfect union with God. Perfect union with God. So our desire in heaven is God alone. Now, in, in this life, we, we don't see God as he is. We see him in his creatures. We see the hand of the creator in his creation. And so we love our dogs. We love our animals because they are signs to us of the goodness and the love of God himself. But through a life of faith and through a life of seeking the good, and we pray by the end of that very life, we will know God well, that, that, that we will know him for himself and not for his creation. We will love God for himself and not for all the good and the goods that he gives us. Um, so, so the answer for that is that our, in heaven, our only desire will be God, God himself. And, 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 with, and, and, and so, so our dogs and our cats and all of our loved creatures of the world, um, although they would have a place in heaven in a sense, they don't really belong in heaven. Not because God is mean or not because God doesn't will them. But that, but, that, but that they are already, as it were, just mere representations of the goodness of God. And so they are stepping stones for us to understand and to love, to know affection, to know care. And they will help us to know God um, better. And once we know God in himself, we won't need the images of God in the world. So... Um, so when, when, when a creature dies, when a dog dies, um, it, 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 it returns to the earth from which it came. But it, it, it remains in our memory. It remains in our hearts for the good that it is. And, and what is that good but a sign of the very goodness of God? It's a sign of the goodness of God. So let us... Let us turn our focus from the signs of goodness to the very goodness itself, to the good, to the perfection that is God. I know it doesn't really answer the question so very well, but you know how I like to take a big walk with you, even if it means taking a, a hike through the wilderness of Alaska. <laughs> so, um, yeah, our, our God... God is more than just the goods of the earth. He's the perfect good. And, 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 and we, all the more perfect that we become, um, become that much more like God. And we find ourselves in him. And we will, re we will rejoice together. Because you and I, again, have a rational nature. You and I have a will. And 
when that will is perfectly united to God, then we see as he sees. We know as he knows. We love as he loves. And God wills that for us, to raise us up to know him and, and to rejoice with him for all eternity. Um, we become little less than God's ourselves, as Psalm 8 says. There's, there's a certain divinization that occurs. Not that we become God, or that we get lost in God, or that we are somehow other gods in competition with his divinity, but that we are, that we are united with him, and that we share in his nature, as Christ Jesus shared in our nature. That we can, that we can, that we can be raised up in our nature and see him as he is. It's a beautiful thing to think about. Um, so our dogs will be with us in heaven in that they will be that that the memory of the goodness of God that was signified by that dog, by that cat, by that beloved animal, by that beloved view of creation, by that beloved place you know that we like to go to, that beach or that mountaintop, um, all of that will be with us because it, it does form us. Um, and, and we will, and, 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 and we will have, we will have all things and more. We lose nothing, as Pope Benedict said in his um, inaugural homily for the uh, inauguration of his pontificate in 2005. Uh, when we accept Christ, we lose nothing. When we, when, when we return unto God from whom we came, we will have everything because we will have him, not in a possessive sense, but in that unitive sense of, of his life, eternal life given unto us. Um, what is the role of a nun? Oh, well, so that's a good question. So nun, um, the role of a nun, N-U-N, as opposed to N-O-N-E, which are the, you know, the nuns in the world today in our society, you know, those who profess no religious affiliation. Uh, sometimes we talk about the nuns. and um, now, but here we're talking about the real nuns, N-U-N. Um, and a, a nun is specifically a religious sister in cloistered life, if, if, if I'm not incorrect. I may be corrected, um, but uh, because there are, there are sisters. So in religious life, whether it's um, uh, male religious or female religious, in religious life as opposed to um, priestly life, diocesan life, Religious life is um, those whom we recognize to be in orders or in communities. They are in religious, um, they belong to a community uh, that shares a particular charism. And, uh, and sometimes it's a community that is, uh, that is cloistered or closed, contemplative, that is they uh, they live in a monastery, they live in a convent, in a, in a, in a cloister, or there is um, religious life that is apostolic, that is sent out. Remember what the word apostol means, ap apostle, apostolain, to be sent out, to be sent out. And so there are, um, there is apostolic life in religious life, or there's contemplative life in religious life. In apostolic life are those uh, sisters, religious sisters, like our sisters of St. Joseph or sisters of Providence, sisters of uh, Notre Dame here in, uh, here in the Diocese of Springfield, who, um, who go out and teach in our schools or work in our hospitals, who go out and engage in, um, in apostolic activity. And they have a proper charism. They have a proper mission and, 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 and the unity about their character. And we call those sisters, sister so-and-so, right? We, we, and, and they're religious sisters. Um, and, 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 and those are, um, those are religious sisters or religious brothers 
uh, who serve in activities in, in apostol apostolic work in the world. Then there's the contemplative, and contemplative sisters, that is like our um, beautiful monastery of visitation nuns, or the beautiful monastery in West Springfield of the Dominican nuns. That these are nuns, nuns, these are religious sisters who live in contemplative life, typically in cloisters, that they are, as it were, set apart from the world, set apart from uh, the rest of society and dedicated, consecrated to a life of prayer. And so their work is not active in the sense of teaching or, or medicine or, or um, care of persons in the world. No, their work is, 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 is as much sacrificial, as much um, active, but one that's more contemplative in nature. And so their work is prayer. Their work is intercession, that they intercede for you and I and for all of us in the world. They bring our prayers, our very intentions before God Almighty. And they have a regular life of prayer, an orarium. Um, and, our, and, I, and I think of our beautiful uh, visitation nuns. After the order of the visitation founded by St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane de Chantal. And, and there in Tiringham, in the Berkshire Hills, a beautiful and, and warm monastery. And they have a regular order of prayer, daily mass at 7.30 or 7.45. You can remind me, good sisters. Um, I love to visit them. And, um, and, and then they have different activities, different works for the benefit of the community and for the benefit of one another. Um, and then they return to prayer for our benefit. And they intercede and they pray and they ask God's blessing upon this world and upon this diocese. Ask God's blessing upon our families, upon you. Uh, so those are nuns. Like I said, here we have the visitation nuns or the Dominican nuns. They are in contemplative life, set apart dedicated to prayer. Then we have those religious sisters um, who are active in, in another way and who serve the church and the people of God in another way. Um, also certainly by prayer, but, uh, but, their, but their work is more engaging in, in, in the needs of, uh, of, of contemporary life in the world today in that way. Um, now let me just is, is say also Sometimes, even within certain orders, like the Dominican order, you can have both apostolic and contemplative uh, communities. So, for example, again, the Dominican order. There are Dominican sisters and there are Dominican nuns. Dominican sisters, for example, the, uh, the Nashville Dominicans or the Ann Arbor Dominicans, uh, the Dominicans of, of Mary, the mother of the Eucharist, who go out and teach, and they teach, and they serve, or they serve in our, um, they serve in, certainly in our schools beautifully, and, and they serve in, um, even in other capacities. And then, like I said, there's the Dominican nuns, like I mentioned, the Dominican nuns in West Springfield. And I'd love for you to go visit them sometime. Please do, and support them, uh, and, and, and support religious life, especially amongst our religious sisters, those who are apostolic, and those who are contemplative. And maybe you know a, a young girl or a young woman who's excited or interested in that kind of life. To be set apart, often in the habit, like a priest is in his cassock or, or um, religious garb, set apart so that we may know that we are in the world but not of the world. We serve the world, but we are, um, we are serving God in the midst of the world. Um, so maybe that's something that gives you an idea about nuns. We're going to keep going here because I know I, I get two questions and I'd take up an hour. So, um, you know, that's, that's my way. Ay, ay, ay. I love the questions, but I love to talk about, you know, all the different aspects of it. So I'll try to be more concise. Um, what books about St. Joseph do you re recommend to read to learn more about Jesus' earthly father? I hope I phrased it right. Yes, you did. Um, earthly father, our fa uh, the foster father of Jesus, the one who was entrusted to him. St. Joseph, that's a good question. Um, 
off the top of my mind, I can't think of one, although I was just given by one of our beautiful parishioners, Maria, and it's sitting on my desk right now, The Life of St. Joseph, and I can't remember who it was written by, but The Life of St. Joseph. Um, it's, this, it's this silver book um, with, with um, particular meditations and prayers of, of one uh, who had a particular devotion to St. Joseph. But the, the, the author is escaping from me right now. But when I take a look, I'll, we'll post it on our YouTube channel um, or as a comment here. And, and I'll, we'll get it right after, right afterwards. Um, but you know, when, I'm, when we're talking about St. Joseph, my mind is really going right now to St. Andre Bessette. St. Andre Bessette was a, um, a, a religious brother, not a priest, but a religious brother, who um, lived up in Montreal. And he had a great devotion to St. Joseph. And, and maybe many of us are already familiar with him. He was here. He had family here in Chicopee and Holyoke. He would visit here in Springfield in western Massachusetts, also Rhode Island and other parts of New England. Um, but he, he built a, that great, that great uh, sanctuary of St. Joseph because he knew St. Joseph's intercession it was powerful and strong. And he had a special oil uh, that was, that was uh, for the lamps that were lit in in, um, in, in, in devotion to St. Joseph. And, and if someone was, had an ache or a pain or something, uh, he would ask them to rub some oil of St. Joseph and to pray to St. Joseph. You know, there's that physical sense, but there's that powerful. It's not, the, it's not the oil itself, but it's the intercession of the saint, the intercession um, and the work of God through the intercession of that saint, through... Uh, the means of that uh, that prayer and that and that simple action of of of, um, of of using that oil that that leads someone to um, to gain that grace that is needed or the answer of that prayer. So I'd invite you to um, to to uh, perhaps reach, uh, um, Google the um, the 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 uh, sanctuary of Saint Joseph Saint Andre Bassett's community. And, and then I know that they would have wonderful resources, uh, perhaps even available in their online bookshop um, on the life of St. Joseph. And that's just one, but there's so many others um, that, that I'd love to share with you and, and so many other communities that are dedicated to St. Joseph. Um, and, and I pray follow his, follow his witness and his model of care for the family and care for the child Jesus uh, to grow in holiness and virtue. How will our relationship with our spouses be different in heaven? Oh, that is such a good question. Oh, my gosh. How will our relationship with our spouses be different in heaven? <laughs> I think I have like 10 minutes, uh, five minutes before uh, we start getting, you know, we reach the top of the hour. But um, how will our relationship with our spouses be different in heaven? So let's, let's face the first question, which is the nature of our spouses. Our spouses are God's gift to us for our salvation and sanctification, for our sanctification and our salvation. Our spouses, when, when a husband takes a wife, when a wife takes a husband, we do so um, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse meaning that they are our helpmate to grow in holiness, to live in this life, to face the challenges of this life, not just the um, passing challenges of, of difficulty at work or, um, or uh, taking care of health, but the challenge of being saint, growing in virtue, and a husband and wife help one another to grow in virtue. And when you look into the eyes of your spouse, may you see eyes that are looking unto you with love, with um, devotion, with, with common commitment to do the work of your life. And what is the work of your life? It's not the job that you do early in the morning, getting ready uh, to, to go to work. It's not the job that you do, um, you know, getting, uh, building up security and, 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 and establishing for yourself a, 
a bright future. No, the work of your life is your sanctification and that of your family. To be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. And, and mothers and fathers are given a, a particular task to raise their children in sanctity, their sons, their daughters, to help them grow in holiness, that is to choose the good and to avoid that which is evil, to choose the good within themselves, um, to be more, ever more reflective of God. That's what our mothers and our fathers do for our children. And, and our society must, must promote family life because it must promote that, that tender place of the care of souls. Our young children, our sons, our daughters, to grow in a, to, through, uh, through childhood and adolescence to adulthood, to exercise their will for the good and not for the passing evils. Um, and, and, and sometimes there are families where, where a husband and a wife do not have children. God has not given them that particular gift. And, 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 and sadly in our world today we're, we're doing all this, well, I, I deserve to have a baby. That's not the way. That's not the way God gives us this gift. Um, that's not the way that we are to, to lead our life as though we deserve something. No, um, God entrusts to some of us a family. To others, he entrusts other gifts that a husband and wife may care for one another um, and, and care for the world around them in a different way. Uh, but as much a sacrificial way, as much a life-giving way. Um, so when a husband and a wife when our spouses um, in life, we are given to one another for each other's good, to bring each other to heaven, to, to know God. Um, so love your husband. Love your wife. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. And see your very mission in life to lay down your life for your friends, that is your beloved. And as we lay down our lives for our beloved, as we lay down our lives for our children, um, we share in each other's mission. Husband, set your mission to be, to be the sanctification of your family. And wives, share in that mission of your husband. Share in that mission. He who carries the cross for the family, who lays down his life for the family. And likewise, um, our beloved wives who, who share in that mission of that family. That in, in, we hear in sacred scripture, wives be submissive to your husbands. Now in contemporary culture, that may sound like patronizing and misogynistic, but it's far from it. Because in the word itself, submissio, there is the word, there, there is the very sense of the mission that is shared. That, that a husband who, 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 who leaves his mother and his father and clings to his wife, who lays down his life for his wife and for his children, the wife shares in that mission. It's, 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 it's a mission that is under the very mission of, of, of sanctification. It's a share in it. So please, please be careful of the way that our world understands our words and how it's going far from it and losing all sense of, sense of right and wrong and how easily we, we, we fall into prejudice. But come back to what, what the truth is that a husband lays down his life for his wife and his children. A wife lays down her life in support of that mission for the sanctification of our families. Now our spouses, as our spouses are given to us in this life, 
as Catholics, we believe that, um, you know, that our, our marriage is to be, is, 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 is to be, um, is a sacrament that is given to us in this life uh, for, for each other's good. And upon death, we have fulfilled that task, in a sense. When our spouse passes away, it is our duty to pray for them. It is our it is to 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 care for them, in as a, as the soul that has as we pray returned unto God, is praying that they be uh, that they be in heaven. Um, but then after death, we believe that we are free to marry again. After the death of a spouse, because again the the work of our life is our sanctification. And so we are free to marry again um, so that we may continue that work of our sanctification. For the spouse that has died, we can pray now that their work is completed. Right? Um, and, and when we come to heaven, when we see God face to face, we will see our spouses we pray. We, we pray that we've, we've been open to God's will in our lives. We have um, won heaven by the merits of Christ and his cross. We've, we've given ourselves to the Lord and he has taken us as his own. We pray that we will be in heaven with our spouses. And I would say, and this is me saying, I would say that we... We will rejoice in our spouses once more. But that we who have loved our spouses so totally in that human capacity that we are capable of in this life will then be able to love all our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, so much more totally. In this life, because of our weak human nature, we, we, it's difficult for us to love so totally and to love all. Um, and it would be imprudent for us to suddenly say, well, I'm going to have like 10 wives and my and, and, and wife's going to have 10 husbands, right? I'm, I'm trying to get, not lead us down the path that somehow says, well, then I should be able to have as many wives and husbands as I want. No, because again, in our human nature, we are prone to sin, right? Um, so there is exclusivity in our love so that our love, even in that one relationship between husband and wife, may grow to perfection. And once in God, once in heaven, then our relationships that we aspired, at least in that one relationship, to be, to be more perfect, then, then, then I, I pray in, in my mind, that our relationships with all will be that much more perfect because, because we have grown into that stature. Um, when please, and, 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 and if I were to say something that were to go against the catechism, and I pray I'm, I don't, um, or that would go against the teachings of the church, then I am wrong. If I go, if I say something that would be contrary to the catechism or the teachings of the church, um, but I think that, but but in, again, in my mind, that's how I see our love. In marriage, our love is beautiful and 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 procreative. It, it brings forth life. It is supportive. It is, it, it is, it's, it's the closest that we can in our human capacity. Our capacity is limited. Our capacity is small. And even if we wanted to say that we could love perfectly and we could love all as we love our husbands and our wives, um, I think we know that that's not true. I think we know that, that, that even, if we, even if we try, we, 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 we falter in love. So let us, let us, always, again, turn towards loving as God loves, as best we can. Um, and, and, and perfecting that love in this life as best we can, in our families, in our marriages, 
in our communities. Right? That, it, it's good to think about loving the world. But, but if we can't even love the person in front of me, then how do we really love? Um, there's a line, it's, it's kind of a joke, I guess, um, but it, it's, it said, you know, um, the more, and I don't know who said it, and we can, you can search for it, the more I love humanity, the less I love the human person. <laughs> or the more I love humans, the less I like humanity, something like that, which is kind of sad. But yeah, sometimes what happens is that we become so inflated with our high sense of humanity and love for all of humanity that we don't even know how to love the person, the human person, with all their defects, with all their warts, with all their wrinkles. We may think we're so high-minded, but we've lost the sense of the personal, of the human. Um, so I invite, so let us practice deep and authentic and, and sacrificial and real love of our spouses, of our families, of our neighbor. And the more perfect we grow in that love, the more perfect we will grow in love for all of God's people. And, um, and then in heaven, will know that love perfectly. Um, ah. <laughs> Beautiful question. And one that I invite your continuing contemplation. Um, what is the difference between a brother and a priest? Uh, the difference between a brother and a priest is, well, a priest is, is consecrated. So a priest is one who offers sacrifice. The priest offers sacrifice. He stands in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal high priest. He stands in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the priest, the altar, and the, and the victim that is the lamb of sacrifice. Um, so a priest is one who leads, guides, intercedes, and, um, and, and has a proper role. When we... When we celebrate mass for example it's not it's not me who is offering sacrifice but it's Christ himself who's offering the sacrifice and I am I am standing in his person I am speaking his words because they're not my words they're his given to us uh, passed on in, in sacred tradition right take this all of you and eat it this is my body this is my blood and it's not, it's not the, the body of this flesh, but it's the body that is the flesh of Christ Jesus himself. And that flesh of Christ Jesus himself nourishes this body so that the priest, in, in, in an authentic way, does unite himself with Christ and is, in that sense, offering his very body. But, it, but this priest's body is not redeeming you. It's Christ's body that's redeeming you. And I pray to be that much more united with Christ in the flesh and in the spirit, in his very being. Um, that's why there is a due respect for priests. In, 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 in some places of the world, we say, um, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Now that respect for a priest has been lost because of, because of the faults of many priests and the crimes and so many priests um, and society has lost that sort of deference to the priest who is Christ um, rather than the priest who is noble in his own right. No, the priest is not any better than any of us in his own right. But the priest it, um, deserves a respect for the Christ that he um, offers us. Um, so pray for your priests and, and, and ask for your priests to, to be more Christ-like. Ask for your priests 
to, to be Christ to the world and to us. Um, so the priest is one who intercedes, who offers sacrifice. A brother is, um, is, can also be consecrated, um, but he's not consecrated to service uh, in sacrifice, in the minis priestly ministry of Christ. But he is, as it were, um, received into a community. And, and so like a religious brother um, is, is, is one who, like the nuns that we spoke of earlier, or the religious sisters that we spoke of earlier, belongs to a community, a congregation, an order, an institute. And, um, and, and he is called brother because he shares in fraternity and brotherhood with others of that community, of that congregation, of that institute. And congregation, community, institute, society, these are all different grades, if you will, of um, religious communities, religious houses. Um, and like I said, there's Franciscans, there's Dominicans, there's um, Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, there are the Christian brothers, there are um, so many different communities. You know, and, and Franciscans, they say that even St. Francis doesn't know how many Franciscan groups there are because there's so many, right? There's the Capuchin Franciscans, there's the conventual Franciscans, there's so many different types of Franciscans. Um, so, so within religious houses, within religious houses, like the Carthusians, uh, founded by St. Bruno in the Charter House of France, in the mountains of France, the Carthusians. I love the Carthusians. Um, and, uh, and, they, they, and, and, and if you study them, you'll say, like, that makes totally no sense. Father, you and Carthusians, and you think you'd let you be a good Carthusian? Like, that's crazy. Because um, they... <laughs> They live in complete isolation. They're like hermits who live in community. So, so if you know my character and my style, you'd be like, "Well, Father, you're nuts." But I like, but I love the Carthusians for the, um, um, I would dare say, for the romance of the idea of of such a life completely dedicated to prayer, and 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 so almost a hermetical life. It's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful life and 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 God be praised that there are those who would follow it. Um, but the Carthusians, you know, many of them are brothers, so they are religious men who have who have uh, given their lives over to to prayer and 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 in that life in that community. Um, many of them are brothers, and so they share in a fraternity with one another as Carthusians, and some of them will be ordained as priests so that they may offer the sacrifice of the Mass, that they may offer the sacraments. And so they become fathers. Not be, but they remain brothers, but they are called father so-and-so. And why do we call a priest father? Not because he's your father. Not because he, um, uh, he has something greater. But rather that he stands in the person of Christ offering the sacrifice. So when you call a priest father, you're not giving him the respect in virtue of himself, whatever his talents may be, but in virtue of Christ. When you call someone father, you are acknowledging his Christ-like sacrifice, his Christ-like ministry, his Christ-like person. That's why you call a priest father. Not because he is your father or because he's a master or because he's somehow greater, but because, he, because Christ is greater. And it is Christ that the priest is in deference to and that we are in, that we are in, um, in, in relationship with. And that's why we call him father, because he points us to the father. He points us to know the father. So, um, just some thoughts, and I know we've gone all over the place, and maybe I don't close these sessions well, and just kind of like, whoop, there it is. But um, next weekend is Corpus Christi, and um, and I'd love if we could organize a procession. God, I'd love to have one. We need to have these processions. We need to have uh, the presence of Christ 
in our public square, but you can bring him by your witness. And you need to demand that our, that our societies accept Christ because our society, at least here in the United States, is, um, is, is a, a society of the people, for the people, and by the people. So you are the ones who are electing your governors, your representatives, your senators. And then our mayors, our, our city councils, our town representatives. You are electing them. And then they are the ones who are saying that we can do things or cannot do things. That's it. So exercise your vote well and, and, and demand that Christ be present in the world. Not just by our own witness, which is good, by our own religious freedom to worship Christ somewhere there on Main Street in the churches, but to worship Christ in public, freely and openly, to let Christ be known. So I'd love to have a Corpus Christi procession to bring our blessed Lord present in the sacrament, present in the flesh, down, down at least the sidewalks of Main Street. But we need to organize it. And, and as of yet, it has not been organized uh, because we have a lot of uh, concerns for health and safety and, um, and, and, and the guidelines that, that are ours in regards to um, public gathering. So if it's possible to do it according to the state guidelines and the diocesan directives, those who lead us in, in, in the church and in, in the world, uh, then, then I would be happy to do it. But I, we, we certainly would have to follow those guidelines that are asked of us. We have to follow that authority. Um, but let us never, ever forget the authority of God himself. So be saints, be holy, be faithful yourselves. God bless you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.